Outlaws of Thunder Junction is finally here, and it just might be the biggest spoiler day ever, so yeehaw, I guessin'. Well, let's break down some spicy new magic cards. Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it is time for our first daily dose of Outlaws of Thunder Junction spoilers. So today, Wizards kicked off the new set with a huge spoiler day. Honestly, today is, I think, the biggest spoiler day that we've ever had, or at least it feels like it. We have like 30 mythics to talk about. We have like three sets in one because of the big score bonus sheet that was added after they canceled the aftermath. There's special sheets and special guests. We have a ridiculous amount of stuff to talk about, which means we should probably jump right into it and start talking really spicy new magic cards. And I will warn you two things. One is, this video is going to be pretty long because we had a lot of cards to talk about. Two is, these cards are way better than I thought. After Murders at Carter Love Manor, I was thinking, eh, maybe Watsy is trying to like power down standard a little bit, but this set is full of really hyped, pushed, exciting cards that are going to see a lot of play. Before we jump into today's cards, a couple of quick reminders. First, if you need any of these cards, you can pre-order them from our sponsor, Car Kingdom, over at carkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish. Second, to keep up on all the latest spoilers throughout the day, you should head on over to mtgpreviews.com. Anyway, let's talk Outlaws of Thunder Junction. First up today, we have a ton of mythics, including a new Gitrog in the Gitrog Ravenous Raider and... This card is kind of ridiculous. So, 5 mana, 6, 5. Legendary Frog Horde Mutant. It has Trample and Haste. So, that by itself is already a pretty good card. And then, when it deals combat damage to a player, you can sacrifice a creature that saddled it. If you do, you draw X cards. And then you can put X land cards from your hand onto the battlefield tapped, where X is a sacrifice creature's power, and it has Saddle 1. So, Saddle is a new mechanic, but it's actually pretty simple. It's basically vehicles, but for creature. Saddling is like crewing a vehicle, but your creatures do it instead. So it's supposed to be like mounting a horse, or in this case, mounting a frog horror, I guess. Uh, but essentially, you're hopping on the creature and going for a ride. Uh, and this card is really strong. So I think just a 5 mana 6 5 trample aster, that's a pretty efficient card. And then you're also getting this kind of like disciple of bolus effect, where you can sacrifice something that's kind of useless, maybe not that important, and draw a bunch of cards and maybe put a bunch of lands into play tap so this is a card that i don't even think you really need to build around that much like we already have a tier golgari list in standard this playing cards like mosswood red knight glissa and the getrog seems like an easy inclusion there maybe just a couple of copies but you can like use your mosswood red knight to saddle up your getrog monster and then you get in with the getrog you sack the mosswood red knight you draw three cards put some lands into play and then what do you care that you sack the dread knight because you're just going to cast it again from your graveyard as an adventure and start the process over it's also a cute way to get rid of of extra legends. One thing we've seen in recent magic is there's a lot of legendary creatures. We've been talking about this for a couple of years now. And the downside of all these powerful legends is you can only ever have one on the battlefield. So maybe you have a Gliss on the battlefield, but you got another Glissa or two in hand. You can saddle up your Gitrog with your Glissa, sack the Glissa, draw some cards, do some ramping, and then just play your other Glissa. And there's not much of a drawback. So I think the Gitrog is actually really, really good. Could also show up in some sort of like Blossoming Tortoise Soul of Windgrace style deck. These decks are often about ramping, filling the graveyard. Again, you have legends. You can be playing, you know, the sack fodder. You can still have the Mosswood Red Knights or whatever. So it seems like a good option there where this is giving you card advantage. It's giving you ramp. It's giving you a huge threat to close out the game. And if you want to go deep on this card, like maybe in a commander deck, it's all about getting the biggest creature possible to ride the Gitrog. Like a Demigoth Titan, four mana, 11, 10. If it attacks or blocks, you got to sack a creature, which is annoying. But if you just play this on turn four and then Gitrog on turn five and saddle it up and ride your Gitrog monster with your Demigoth Titan, you can sack the Demigoth Titan, draw 11 cards, put up to 11 lands into play tapped. Also really good with like Rotting Registrar. We still have Shakedown Heavy in standard. I could see this showing up in some sort of fight rigging style deck. Uh, Gitrog's another creature that has high enough power that it'll trigger your fight rigging the turn after it comes into play. Plus a fight rigging deck is going to have all these Shakedown Heavies and big creatures that you can just sack to the Gitrog monster to ramp and just cast your big stuff and win the game that way. So I think Gitrog is actually like really, really strong. This might be the best standard Gitrog yet. The past Gitrogs have either been not really playable or the original Gitrog 
more of like a combo piece this just seems like a good threat that you can just jam into a deck and go to town with so i think this god gitrog is actually gonna see a lot of play we also got double down so double down showing off another new mechanic from the set or i guess it's not technically a mechanic i don't know what this technically is it's a new batching effect which is outlaw so double down four mana enchantment it says when you cast an outlaw spell copy that spell so outlaws are assassins mercenaries pirates rogues and warriors uh, and worth mentioning uh you get to make token copies of the permanent so if you cast a assassin creature you're gonna get two of those assassin creatures if this card looks familiar it's essentially necro duality but for outlaws rather than zombies there's a slight twist here necro duality triggers when a zombie etbs double down triggers when you cast an outlaw spell i think in general the etb is a more powerful effect because it works with some additional synergies cheating things into play and so forth although it is nice with double down that if your opponent has a counter spell and you cast an outlaw even if they counter one copy of it you probably still get the other one so the question is just how good is this card and i think the answer is really it's probably going to depend on outlaws at thunder junction i was looking for outlaws through our current standard pool and one of the big problems i have with this card is an issue that you sometimes run into with necro duality and definitely run into with the original version of this effect the the Keldheim one where you get to choose a creature type I can't think of the name of it right now uh, but the problem with this is legendary creature so some of the best outlaws are going to be legends Atrada, Massacre Girl, Hilda, Breaches, Malcolm a bunch of the stuff from the new set that we're going to talk about that happen to be outlaws they're legends in making an extra copy of a legend just doesn't really do anything right you get two Atradas but you only really get to keep one because of the legend rule so that's a big problem I see with this is we get so many legends these days that it actually sometimes takes a lot of work to build around a card like this to find enough non-legends to actually meet its criteria but there are some if you look at standard like Bane Ripper is an assassin that's an outlaw two of them seems pretty devastating or fairy mastermind charming scoundrel corpse appraiser gumdrop poisoner spyglass siren and I'm sure we're gonna get many more outlaws in the set because that's kind of the whole theme of outlaws at Thunder Junction so this is a card that I'm definitely excited to build around I love necro duality and zombies it's one of my favorite decks to lose consistently with I've never really managed to break that deck but I do enjoy playing it so I think I'm definitely going to try to build around this in standard worst case seems like a really fun build around for some sort of outlaw commander deck we also got the return of Jace that's right Jace is back apparently not dead not Phyrexian maybe Phyrexian kind of looks like Ashiok I don't know what's going on with Jace but we have Jace reawakened a new two mana planeswalker double blue for three loyalty it has the first ever negative static ability on a planeswalker I believe you can't cast this Jace during your first second or third turns of the game so even though it's two mana you can't just drop it on turn two it's abilities plus one draw a card then discard a card plus one you may exile a non-land card with mana value three or less from your hand if you do it becomes plotted we'll wrap back around to this in a minute and then negative six until end of turn whenever you cast a spell copy it you can choose new targets for the copy so plotting another new mechanic is actually kind of simple when you plot a card you exile it face up you have to pay in this case you don't pay anything uh, most of the cards that are actually have the plot mechanic is going to be like pay its mana cost or something similar to its mana cost so you play the plot cost of the card and then on a future turn at sorcery speed during your turn you can cast that card for free so the idea of this jace is it's kind of like a self-contained army right you play this jace and you uptick you uptick you uptick you plot a card plot a card plot a card and then when you get to the negative six you can alter the jace and then cast all those cards you plotted for free but you're gonna get two copies of them instead plus it also is gonna copy anything else that you actually spend mana on so i actually think this jace is kind of interesting so first jace is looking a little ashiaki i don't keep up on the story enough to know what's going on with this but there's something to do with jason ashiak if you know exactly what's going on with jason ashiak let me know in the comments this is also notable because it's only our second ever well third ever second ever standard legal two mana planeswalker we also got ren and six in a mod set but this is our second ever standard legal two mana planeswalker the first one was Tybalt the fiend blooded which went down as the worst planeswalker in the history of the game I think that Jace is going to do a little bit better than that I actually think despite the drawback of not being able to cast this on the first three turns of the game this is a pretty powerful effect it comes down in loots which is a good ability you're filling the graveyard you're finding what you need the plotting ability we kind of talked about and then the ultimate is kind of ridiculous the turn you ultimate this you 
kind of get a free Lithiform engine for every single thing you cast. So you're copying all your creatures, all your instants, all your sorceries, anything you cast, you're going to get two of, which is a really, really strong effect. The question is, where exactly does this card fit? I think you could just jam this in a control deck and it'll be fine. Uh, it doesn't really plot well in a control deck because you need permanence or cards with mana value three or less which is going to be a little awkward you don't really want to be plotting like counter spells or instants because you can't cast them at instant speed so they're not really going to do anything so that would be the downside in a control deck but still i think that's the sort of shell where you can play this a, a dedicated plot deck obviously is a really nice home for jace but the place i'm most excited to play this card is actually in the reenact the crime conspiracy and raveler deck we just played this deck a couple of days ago on the youtube it's really sweet and jace is perfect for the deck because all the deck wants to do is just loot and loot and loot and fill the graveyard and then reenact a grime, the conspiracy and raveler and cast a bunch of stuff for free and chain together a bunch of breathe the multiverses and win the game jace seems built for that deck so i think at a minimum jace is good there the other cute thing about this jace is even though it's only two mana you can't cast it until your turn four but there's some upside here right if you're casting this on turn four it means you have enough mana that you can cast your jace and leave up a no more lies or a negate or a make disappear or an instant speed removal spell so there is some upside with how it actually works out timing wise the other thing worth mentioning and this is <laughs> I don't know if it's very realistic, but it's worth pointing out. If you read Jace closely, it says you can only cast this spell during your first, second, or third turns of the game. It does not say that you can't cast Jace on your opponent's first, second, or third turn of the game, uh, which technically means if you have like a ley line of anticipation, so you can cast things as if they had flash, you can flash Jace in on your opponent's turn as early as turn one. So I don't think Jace is strong enough that you're actually can build around this but it is a neat synergy to keep in mind if you happen to be playing jace in a deck that can cast jace with flash you can flash it in on your opponent's turn despite its static ability on those first three turns of the game so jace reawaken not really sure what's going on with this card lore wise but it's a two mana planeswalker that is way stronger than tabal it's got good abilities has synergies with plot the sets mechanic if you can get to the ultimate it can really do some big things and worst case seems really good with the reenact the crime deck we also got this card. I honestly almost cannot believe this card exists. This card, one of the best, but also one of my most disliked cards, I think, from the set. Final Showdown. So it has a new mechanic in Spree. In Spree is an awesome mechanic. I love this mechanic. It's just this card I'm a little bit eh, about. So Spree is kind of like multi-kicker. You can see with Final Showdown, it costs one white mana plus, which means you have to pay one white mana, and then you have to pay at least for one of its Spree abilities. So you can choose to use one of its Spree abilities, two or all three, any combination of those, whatever you choose. You can't use any of them more than once so essentially you can't cast this for one mana but you can cast it for one white mana plus one generic mana to make all creatures lose all abilities you could cast it for one white plus one generic mana to make a creature you control become indestructible until undeterred you can cast it for one white mana plus three and two white mana to destroy all creatures or if you wanted to you can pay for all of those you can pay a white and a generic for the first ability another generic for the second and five more mana for the third and do all those things together but the real power of this card is this is a six mana instant speed wrap and it even has a bunch of upsides like you can make creatures lose all abilities so if your opponent has indestructible stuff or you cursive stuff this is going to get around it plus you can even pay even more mana to save one of your creatures because creatures losing abilities the uh, cards resolve top down so creatures would lose all their abilities first and then you would give one of your creatures indestructible after it lost all of its abilities and then you blow up all the creatures so this is a ridiculous card if you look in magic i believe there's only two cards that are really instant speed white ras one is faded retribution seven mana the other is route which you can cast as instant for two more mana so it's essentially seven mana final showdown is the new fastest least expensive instant speed wrath and it's way more than that it's a wrath that has all these upsides of making creatures lose abilities of saving one of your creatures this is an absurd card i do not think that what standard needed was another really pushed wrath in world of sunfalls and farewells and 36 wraths being a legitimate 
legitimate strategy that you can actually build a deck around in standard but this is an incredibly strong card so if you think about all this does not only is this an instant speed wrath we've seen dress down which makes creatures lose all the abilities be a pretty powerful effect where you can use this to like play in a row and keep it around and not escape it or a karoxa it's used in modern to make urza's saga tokens lose all their abilities so they just die so even just two mana one right plus make creatures lose all abilities that's a pretty powerful effect also the wrath mode is really frightening it kind of reminds me of cyclonic rift obviously it blows up your creatures too but a big part of the power of cyclonic rift is you cast it on the end step before your turn then you get to untap and do all your stuff first final showdown is like that as well you can cast this as an instant on the end step before your turn and then you get to untap with all your mana and rebuild your board before anyone else so i think this is pretty high in the hierarchy of wrath for commander i think with final showdown maybe not quite farewell tier I think farewell is like the ultimate commander wrath at the moment but i think it's in the next tier definitely above like wrath of god but in like the vanquish the horde style tier where i think if you're playing a white deck this is probably optimal to be in your deck in commander i also think it has a lot of 60 card format potential so does this just straight up beat up sunfall in standard maybe not but i think this will see play alongside sunfall in a control deck the fact that you can cast this as the instant is amazing it is hard to overstate just how important that is you can leave up all your mana for your memory deluges for your wandering emperors for your counter spells for your removal spells and also be leaving up a wrath so i think this is an easy inclusion in control decks in standard and i would not be surprised to see this show up in pioneer control decks maybe even in modern control decks and if you want to be really really mean with this card you can stick it on a isochron scepter so isochron scepter this weird two mana artifact that lets you put an instant under it and then for two mana you can essentially cast that instant so the trick here is final showdown it's only one mana its mana value is one so it's legal to put under an isochron scepter and then when you cast a card with these options like spree from isochron scepter you're still allowed to pay extra mana to choose those options so if you put a final showdown under an isochron scepter every single turn you can pay two for the scepter and then five more and just wrath the board and then pay two and then five more and wrath the board and do that forever if your opponent plays an indestructible thing what do you care this time i'm going to pay six and make your creatures lose abilities and wrath the board so you can essentially just put this under a scepter and lock creatures out of a game of commander altogether so if you really want to make your commander play group hate you i stick a final showdown under an isochron scepter and you'll get to play commander for like 10 hours without anyone winning the game it'll be an absolute blast but seriously this card is like scarily strong like i'm surprised they printed it strong like maybe a little bit too good strong especially in commander but this is a incredibly playable wrath and just really really jaw-dropping card next up in the mythics we got another outlaw in rakdos the muscle so rakdos five mana rakdos colored six five flying trample demon mercenary so it counts as an outlaw it says whenever you sacrifice another creature exile cards equal to its mana value from the top of target player's library until the next end step you may play those cards and mana of any type can be used to cast those spells and then you can sack a creature to give it indestructible and tap it but you can only do it once each turn so rakdos this is another card that just on rate is pretty above the curve like a five mana six five flying trampler you're kind of getting vein ripper stats you don't get the ward obviously but it's one less mana it's only five mana to get vein ripper stats and you get trample and you get a pretty powerful ability where every time you sack a creature you essentially outrageous robbery your opponent equal to that creature's power which is going to eat away your opponent's library really really quickly if you have some big creatures on the board to sacrifice you're going to be stealing huge amounts of cards from your opponent's deck the only difference here is you only get to cast those cards until the next end step so do keep that in mind outrageous robbery you just get to keep the cards forever for the rest of the game ragdose you got to use in that turn and then it also has like immerstrom predator style of protection you can only use it once a turn but sack a creature to tap it and give it indestructible not going to get around to sunfall but he's going to be good at fizzling a go for the throat or whatever that might take down your ragdose so when you put all this together ragdose seems like a pretty playable card to me i think it is very likely the best ragdose so this is Rakdos number five and I think that Rakdos the muscle 
might just be the best of the bunch, at least for 60 card formats. I guess in Commander, Rakdos Lord of Riots is kind of ridiculous because it's just like an absurd ramp spell. Uh, Rakdos the Showstopper saw a little bit of play as a weird wrath. Rakdos Patron of Chaos I thought was like decent, but it hasn't seen any play yet. This Rakdos at only five mana seems like a really scary card. The question is going to be, where do you put this? You probably want some sort of sack deck. I mean, I guess you could just play it for value, but if you're playing it for value and just jamming it in like Rakdos Midrange, or whatever you're probably not going to really sack that many creatures to get value out of it but maybe that's fine maybe just a six five flying trampler for five that can kind of protect itself is good enough but i can imagine playing this with like a cauldron familiar style deck where you're sacking the cat a bunch of times because remember you only get to use the cards you exile until the end of turn, which means if you exile 10 cards from your opponent's library, that's fine if your plan's going to be to just mill them out of the game, but you're not going to be able to cast all 10 of those cards. In some ways, it's better to repeatedly exile a couple cards that you might actually be able to use. In standard, we have like Oni called Anvil, which really likes to be sacrificing 1-1 one, one constructs every turn. If you got a Rakdos out every time you sack one, you're going to trigger Rakdos, and you're going to steal a card from your opponent's deck and maybe play that card. So any sort of sack deck is good. You could also go the other direction you just try to play big creatures and be like i'm just gonna try to exile your whole deck i'm not even worried about casting your cards i'm just gonna sack the biggest things possible and hope that i just burn you out of the game essentially with this exile mill plan there's also combo potential we actually just saw a deck in modern that was trying to go infinite with ultra of dementia in lamplight phoenix lamplight phoenix uh you can collect evidence to get it back from the graveyard tap so you'd sack the lamplight phoenix to ultra of dementia to mill yourself and do it again and do it again by collecting evidence and then eventually turn your opponent to try to mill them out Rakdos would be a perfect finisher there right if you have Rakdos every time you sack the Lamplight Phoenix your opponent's going to exile three cards and they're going to exile three cards so as you're going through this loop of just repeatedly sacrificing the Lamplight Phoenix you're just going to mill your opponent out of the game you're going to exile your entire library also works with like Gravecrawler loops you keep sacking the Gravecrawler to the Carrion Feeder recasting it triggering Rakdos along the way in Commander I think this is an interesting sacrifice commander. I could certainly see building around it. I don't think it's quite Corvald busted. Corvald is like the SSS tier, like super busted, ridiculous sack commander. So if you just want to play the strongest sack deck possible, I think Corvald's still better than Rakdos, but I think that I would play Rakdos in a Corvald deck or in a Jury deck or in a Sauron deck in the 99. And I think once you get past Corvald, Rakdos is a legit super fun sack commander. Not only do you get the sack synergies, but you also get the theft synergies. So even though it might not be as strong as Corvald, I think it might actually be way more fun than Corvold because who doesn't like stealing your opponent's cards and beating your opponent down with them so Rakdos another card that I really like out of this set I'm actually blown away by this set so far it just how powerful it seems so many of these cards are like one less mana or one more power than I would have expected them to be it just seems like a really push set we also got of course a new Kellen we can't have a magic set without having a Kellen these days new Kellen is Kellen the kid a Bant Kellen and it's a three mana three three human fairy rogue it is flying in lifelink and it says whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand you may cast a permanent spell with equal or lesser mana value from your hand without paying its mana cost if you don't you can put a land from your hand onto the battlefield not even tapped it just comes into play untapped so Kellen the kid seems like another really solid card this is Kellen number four and this might be the best of the Kellens. So if you think about it, its stats are essentially a healer's flock. That's kind of a bad example, but a 3-3 Flying Lifelinker isn't bad. I'd rather compare it to Mantis Rider. You don't get the haste, but still, we've seen 3-mana 3-3 Flyers be pretty good in the past, and then its ability is kind of ridiculous. So what does Kellen want? Kellen wants us to be casting spells from anywhere other than our hand. Thankfully, we have about a million mechanics, many of them in standard, that actually let us do this. So this works with Adventure. Adventures. adventures are cast from exile it works with discover discover is cast from exile it works with any sort of impulse draw like ren's resolve it works with flashback like snapcaster mage it works with escape which is from the graveyard it works with cascade like the og discover it works with cards like joda that are like pseudo cascade it works with suspend there are so many mechanics that let you cast cards from exile or from your graveyard that is actually really easy to trigger Kellen. and this doesn't even include just plotting like plotting is another way that you can can trigger Kellen a bunch of times and I'm really impressed with this when I first saw plot I was like 
I don't know why I'd ever want to do this. Why would I ever want to pay my spells mana value and then wait another turn to cast it? That seems really weird. If I got the mana to cast my spell, don't I just want to cast it? Especially with the restriction of sorcery speed. But Kellen's another cute way to take advantage of plot. You can plot a bunch of cards, play your Kellen, and then play all these cards from Exile for free, which are all going to trigger Kellen and let you put a bunch of lands into play, play a bunch of things from free from your hand. So I think that Kellen is actually a really solid payoff for an adventure style deck for some sort of discover slash cascade deck for some sort of plot deck the one thing i did want to point out because i saw some confusion about this kellen very specifically does not work with crashing footfalls or ancestral vision or living it which is a good thing we don't want it to work with those things those things are good enough without kellen's help uh, but if you read kellen carefully it lets you cast a permanent spell from your hand so that means if you cast a spell from exile and you got a crashing footfalls in hand you can't cast it because it's a sorcery it's not a permanent so thank you wizards for actually heading that off because having games where you like cascade into rhinos and get a rhinos and then cast another rhinos for free would be absolutely miserable so kellen I think this card's actually kind of wild. Like, its stats are good, its ability is good. There's probably some combo potential that I haven't figured out yet. Kind of reminds me of Kadama the East Tree with the, like, loopy ability. Maybe being permanent only is enough to, like, reduce that. Plus, you need to actually cast spells to trigger it. So maybe it's safe enough, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone figures out some sort of combo or pseudo combo for this card. So really, Kellen's a character that I'm kind of like, meh, on in most of its cards so far. I've kind of been, eh, whatever. Like, it's fine. It's just Kellen. But this one actually is really exciting, and I'm super hyped to build around it. We also got Creature Veraska in Veraska the Silencer. Veraska, the only outlaw without a cowboy hat, I think. But, uh, as you notice, wizards, make sure to show off the cowboy boots. You gotta have some cowboy accessory on in your card art, or else how are we gonna know where an outlaw is a Thunder Junction? So Veraska the Silencer... 3 mana Golgari, 3-3 three, three, Gorgon Assassin. It is Death Touch, and it says when a non-token creature an opponent controls dies, you may pay 1. If you do, return that card from the battlefield tapped under your control. It's a treasure artifact with tap, sack it, make a mana, and it loses all of their card types. So this card is really wonky, right? It's probably closest compared to, like, Merkle. Merkle makes it so when a non-token creature you controls dies, she can exile it, and then you get an enchantment that is a copy of that card, but it doesn't have any other types. Veraska is most similar to that. So how this is going to work is you play your Veraska, and then you kill your opponent's shieldred. You pay one mana, you're going to get a tap treasure token that has shieldred's text. It is exactly shieldred, but it's not a creature. It's a treasure token. So if your opponent draws a card, they're going to get drained for two. If you draw a card, you're going to gain some life. So you get all of its abilities and everything. It's just not a creature. It's a treasure token. Same with like Fairy Mastermind. Uh, if you kill a Fairy Mastermind and pay the one, you'll get a treasure token Fairy Mastermind. With all of its abilities, if your opponent draws an extra card, you'll get to draw an extra card because of your treasure token fairy mastermind it's just not a creature also works with etb triggers like if you kill his spirited companion you'll get a treasure token spirited companion that'll etb and draw you a card when it enters the battlefield so i think the Veraska definitely has some potential like if you can just play this in a removal heavy deck and kill your opponent's stuff and get treasure token copies of them it could just run away with the game one of the things about this that makes it so strong is a card like shieldred is so game ending if it sticks out on the battlefield that most standard decks are overloaded on ways to kill shieldred because they know if i don't kill shieldred I'm just going to lose. I'm going to get drained out by its uh, by its static ability. But most decks are not going to be prepared for a treasure token shield. It is much easier to kill a creature than a treasure token. So if you can get a Veraska that is actually giving you a shield or a treasure token, there's a decent chance that some decks, or maybe most decks, won't be able to deal with that treasure. So you get a shield or it's going to stick around and probably just win you the game. So the upside of this card is super high. If you just look at the most played creatures in a format like Standard, or really in any format these days, they're pretty much all going to have abilities. There's no vanilla creatures anymore. Everything's got an ETB, a powerful static ability, and is going to be able to give you treasure tokens of all of them. The only downside I see with this card is, can you make it fit in standard? There's just, in this big standard format, so many powerful three drops for a Golgari deck, for a black deck. So this has to beat out like Cliss of the Sun Slayer. It's got to beat out Lord Skitter. It's got to beat out Preacher of the Schism. It's got to beat out Liliana the Veil. So there's a lot of things that it has to beat out. But I think 
if you can find room for this card in a removal heavy shell, it's going to be very, very explosive and super cool. Also worth mentioning, we're getting these join up enchantments. Uh, we've seen Veraska joins up so far, or Tiny Bones joins up, which specifically care about legendary creatures. Like Veraska joins up when he ETBs, it puts a death touch counter on each creature. And then when a legendary creature deals combat damage, you get to draw a card. Tiny Bones joins up when he ETBs, any number of target players discards the card. And then when a legend ETBs, you get to mill someone for one and cause them to lose a life. Any number of people actually you mill one and lose a life. So we see the support for just playing legendary creatures. So that might be the way to make Faraska optimal. Like maybe in most Golgari decks, Preacher of the Schism is going to be the best option in the three drop slot, but maybe you're playing Vraska joins up because it's a really strong effect and you just want everything to be legendary. So rather than Preacher of the Schism, you're playing some Vraskas and some Glissas. So keep that in mind. That's part of the beauty of three year standard is the card pool's getting bigger that we could theoretically have like multiple different versions of Golgari mid range in the same standard format because the card pool is big enough to support it. So Vraska the Silencer. I kind of just love this card. It seems like just such a fun card to kill your opponent's self, get copies of it. I think it's got a chance to see play in standard. And I expect this will be a pretty popular build around in commander where you can like play a Veraska and just rat the board and pay the one a bunch of times and get copies, treasure token copies of all the best things that died. So it seems like a fun build around there too. We also got a new character in Annie Flash the Veteran. And honestly, I feel like Annie Flash got kind of a little bit done wrong by this set. Out of all these super strong push mythics we've been talking about, I feel like Annie Flash is like kind of on the weaker end. So it's a six mana four five. It's a legendary human rogue in the Naya color. So it is an outlaw. It has Flash, of course, because Annie Flash, uh, well done on that one, Wizards. When Annie Flash enters the battlefield, if you cast it, Return target permanent card with mana value 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. And then when it becomes tapped, exile the top two cards of your library. You may play those cards this turn. So Annie Flash, it's not a bad card. If you think about what this is, it's essentially a worse Sun Titan. Well, except for Flash. Flash does kind of make it exciting that you can flash this in, eat something in combat. But its ability is a worse Sun Titan. Sun Titan gets back a permanent mana veal through or less, but it's not tapped and you can blink it or whatever, reanimate it. Annie Flash only works when you cast it. I think that was maybe like an unnecessary drawback. Do you really need to prevent blinking and reanimation on this card on your like chase mythic with your new character? So maybe that would have made it a little bit better. Just make it kind of an actual Sun Titan trigger so you could do some shenanigans. And then if it becomes tapped, you essentially get a Ren's Resolve. You got to use the cards this turn so you don't get until your next turn, but still you get to draw a couple of cards so I think that Annie Flash it does a lot of good things like it can snipe something in combat ambush viper it it can reanimate something it can generate card advantage six mana is just a big number on this card it is a very good saddler or crewer I think that's probably the best way to power up this card that last ability obviously you can attack with Annie Flash to get it tapped and exile some cards to play but it's probably even better to just like saddle up your Gitrog or crew up your Subtridian school Gardener and tap your Annie Flash in a way that doesn't require putting it in combat. If you do it this way, you can consistently be drawing two extra cards each turn, which is actually a pretty powerful effect. I think it's even possible to like go fully infinite with this card. If you can get like freed from the real on Annie Flash, so you can untap it for one blue and then Paradise Mantle on it, so you can use it like a Birds of Paradise. You can like tap it for a blue mana because of Paradise Mana, exile two cards to play, untap it thanks to Freed from the real, and do it again and again, and exile your entire your deck and play your entire deck and find Thassa's Oracle, I guess, and win the game. Hooray. But there is infinite card draw or impulse card draw potential here. So Annie Flash, I'm hoping this card is better than I think. I feel like it's got a shot. I saw a lot of people be really down on this card. Like, worst mythic in the set. This card's horrible. It's stone unplayable. I'm not that down on Annie Flash. I do feel like it's maybe one more mana than I'd expect, considering just how push Gitrog and Rakdos and the rest of these mythics, they seem very pushed. Any Flash doesn't seem that pushed to me. It seems about what I'd expect, maybe a little more than I'd expect mana wise, but it does do a lot of nice things. It offers value. I think people are underestimating the flash aspect of this. Just the fact that you can flash this in and eat one of your opponent's attackers during combat makes it pretty easy to get a two for one out of it. So I think that Annie Flash, 
I'm hoping that it overperforms. I'd really like this card to be good because it's a cool design. It does a lot of neat things. So we'll have to wait and see, I guess. We also got a new Gisa in Gisa the Hellraiser. So Gisa the Hellraiser, five mana four for legendary human warlock. So also an outlaw. It has ward of two mana and pay two life. Skeletons and zombies can you control. Get plus one, plus one and have menace. And whenever you commit a crime, create two tapped two, two blue and black zombie rogue creature tokens. But this ability only triggers once each turn. So committing a crime, I don't think we've talked about this yet. You commit a crime when you target your opponent, anything they control or cards in their graveyard. So basically anything that targets your opponent or any of their stuff is considered committing a crime. And Geese is kind of an interesting card. So at first glance, a five mana Lord for skeletons and zombies, even granting menace, is not very exciting. However, if you can commit a crime or two with Gisa out, it actually makes an absurd amount of power because remember, is gonna pump the zombies it makes. So your two two twos are actually two three threes. So what this means is you can like play Gisa, duress your opponent to commit a crime, get a removal spell or something out of their hand, and you essentially get to cast a moan at the unhollow and your zombies are gonna be three threes. That's a ridiculous amount of power. That ends up being pay six total mana. You get the Gisa itself of four, four and two two three threes and the other thing that's worth mentioning about this card is even though it has the once per turn restriction which apparently pretty much all the crime cards are going to have which is probably good because it's pretty easy to commit crimes and magic you're always targeting your opponent with something uh, but it works during each turn so you can duress during your turn make the zombies and then during your opponent's turn go for the throat and make even more zombies so this is a card that if it sticks out definitely can snowball into a victory you could play it in a zombie deck like necro duality champion of the parish headless rider whatever but i actually think this is probably better in just like a control deck i don't think you need that support this is the army in the can right this is all you really need is gisa and a bunch of things that target your opponent and this can win the game all by itself so I think that Gisa is actually a pretty intriguing card. In Commander, you do get the upside of having three opponents, so that's more turns that you can commit crimes on. What a weird set. Uh, talking about wanting to commit crimes to your opponents being a good thing. What a very odd set, but you can commit a lot of crimes in a game of Commander. That's all I'm trying to say. You're always committing crimes in a game of Commander. So is going to make a ton of zombies there. I feel like this is kind of a mid-tier zombie Commander. It is fun, and the crime thing is interesting, but I do think that, like, it's probably not will help strong or varina strong there's just a lot of really good zombie commanders many of them that give you multiple colors but maybe it's not actually a zombie commander this might actually be more of like a jadar sack commander where you play gisa and you cast spells targeting your opponents to commit crimes to make zombies and then you sack those zombies to attritions and deadly disputes or whatever to get value you could even like throw the new rakdos into the mix to exile some cards and draw some cards that way but i think that might be the direction i would go with this so I almost think that the zombie and skeleton lord thing is more of a trap than it is something you should actually build around with this card. There is one thing I hate about this card, though, which is skeletons, once again, kind of get done dirty by wizards. Like, why is the word skeleton even on this card? I know they wanted to, like, put her in Mark Rosewater's teaser so they could say, hey, new card that says skeleton zombies get plus one, plus one. But really, nothing about this card cares about skeletons. The tokens it makes aren't even skeletons they're zombies why would i play this as my skeleton commander it doesn't care about skeletons at all it just like had that line of text stuck on there for some reason so i actually feel bad skeletons they always get done dirty they always make more zombie stuff and vampire stuff while skeletons are just underappreciated under supported in this card it gave me hope that it was going to be like a cool skeleton card but really, it's just a zombie card with skeleton tacked on for some reason. So, Watsy, someday, someday, give us a real skeleton card. Next up, we got a new Savala in Savala Eager Trailblazer. So, 4 mana, 4, 5, Legendary Elf Scout. It's a mythic. It is Vigilance. It says, when you cast a creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token. With tap, target creature you control gets plus 1, plus 0 until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. And Savala has tap, choose a color, add a mana of that color for each different power among creatures you control. So, Savala's like 
a creature making engine uh, with the tokens it produces the tokens can help change the power of your creatures to power up its second ability to make a bunch of mana so if you think about what this card really is it's kind of like a more expensive torrens torrens is the best comparison for the cast a creature make a 1-1 one -one token ability uh, the tokens it makes are kind of traveling minister but you don't got to worry about gaining life and then like past savala's savala eager trailblazer can make a huge amount of mana if you can get the board set up uh, Savala Heart of the Wild just wants one big creature. Savala Explore Return, kind of a group hug style card, just going to make mana naturally. Savala Eager Trailblazer, there's going to be times when this card pops off. It makes a huge amount of mana and wins you the game. There's also going to be times when you just kind of get Wrath and it doesn't really do anything because you can't build up a big board full of creatures. As far as how strong this card is, I will say for competitive 60 card play, I'm a little skeptical. Like, Torrens is a card that I thought was going to be really exciting and pretty strong, and it ended up not really doing much of anything and when it comes to this effect that like put me on the battlefield cast a bunch of stuff to make a bunch of tokens the cheaper the better we see the competitive versions of this effect be stuff like young pyromancer that's only two mana so at four mana i'm a little worried that by the time you get down savala you've probably already emptied your hand of your novice inspectors and warden of the inner skies and extraction specialists so you could build a deck designed to try to like use savala as the top end of your curve and then make a bunch of tokens with it but i'm skeptical that plan's going to be really strong one place I am really excited about this in Standard is it's an elf. And we recently played Voja in Standard, and I was kind of surprised at just how strong Voja was. The Ward 3 on Voja actually makes it a somewhat playable card even in Standard. The big problem we ran into with Voja is the rest of the elves in Standard are kind of meh. So Vala Eagle Trailblazer is definitely a playable elf in an elf deck just because there's not a lot of competition plus it actually works really well with voja because remember voja when it attacks it puts a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control where x is the number of elves you control so all those mercenary tokens that you're going to make with savala yeah they're not powering up voja directly by being elves but they're still going to get a ton of counters so it seems pretty easy to like savala into voja cast a couple spells make some mercenaries smash your opponent with voja just win the game on the spot the other possibility and uh, this is probably more of a meme, but we've seen the new plot mechanic that allows you to essentially like foretell cards. You kind of pay their mana cost up front and put them in exile, and then you can cast them without paying their mana cost in the future. I guess you could build this weird like Savala storm deck where you try to like plot a bunch of stuff and then play Savala. In the turn you play Savala, just unplot all of your stuff to make a bunch of mercenaries and try to kind of like weirdly storm off and win that way. Still doesn't stop you from just getting Sunfall or Farewell or whatever, because uh, nothing has haste or anything but that could be another option as far as commander is concerned there is some combo potential here probably the easiest way to just go infinite with savala is umbro mantle umbro mantle this three mana equipment that equips for zero and it gives the equipped creature pay three to untap it and give it plus two plus two until end of turn so if you can get this on savala and get enough different powered creatures on the battlefield the savala is tapping for at least four mana you just go infinite you tap it for four and tap it for three tap it for four and tap it for three and with those mercenaries in a commander deck it seems pretty easy to pull this off so i imagine if you're playing savala as your commander umbra mantle and maybe even ways to tutor up and lighten tutor or stoneforge mystic or whatever are going to be staples in that deck because it's just a nice backdoor oops i accidentally made infinite mana in one win condition there's probably also some infinite creature combos like cloudstone curio just to go like keep looping and cast creatures to make a bunch of mercenaries so that's another possibility my biggest concern with savala is i just don't think this card's going to be very good in our commander meta so i think this card how good it's going to be is really going to depend on your play group and how many rasp people are playing because if you think about savala to really do anything you need to play it you need to have it sit on the battlefield most likely for at least one turn then you need to dump your hand of a bunch of creatures to make mercenaries so it kind of incentivizes you to just like play as much stuff as possible because the more creatures you play the more tokens you get the problem with this plan is if your opponent just farewells or onto inversions or toxic deluges or blasphemous acts you're gonna be really sad you emptied your hand to make a bunch of mercenaries and everything has gone away so that's kind of my concern with savala i think in our commander clash play group savala is probably gonna be horrible because a lot of people are playing like five rest and rest in their deck so it's gonna be hard for a card like this to get traction on the other hand if your play group is pretty wrath like and you kind of just like 
let each other do their thing that's where Savala can really pop off if you're not playing a ton of Rast in your decks this card can just come down and sit out and every turn is going to be generating value making tons of mana and eventually just winning the game so Savala I think it's designed more to be a commander card than a 60 card format card although I do want to play it in Voja Elves in standard I think that's maybe my favorite home in 60 card formats in commander I think it can be really strong just keep in mind if you're playing in a playgroup that has a lot of Rast it's going to be really hard to get going we we also got oh my god insatiable avarice and i absolutely love this card so this is one of the new spree cards so it's one black mana except i don't think you can actually cast it for one black mana because of spree you have to choose one or more additional costs so you can play two generic mana to have it search your library for a card shuffle and put it on top or you can pay two black mana for target player to draw three cards and lose three life so if you think about what this card actually is holistically it's essentially like a painful truth say three mana draw three if you choose the second mode it can also be like a really bad imperial sailor like three mana tutor for a card on top of your library i don't think you really ever want to choose that mode unless you're super desperate i think the two modes are three mana draw three in five mana imperial seal and then draw three so you know you're going to draw whatever you tutored into putting that together is a really really strong card like three mana draw threes are already very playable in commander and we've also seen in 60 card formats like painful truce used to see a lot of playback in its day the only downside here is you do need triple black mana so you're not going to be able to play it in you know five color piles even three color decks might be a challenge but as long as your deck can consistently make triple black mana this card's going to be really really solid in it and then you get the upside that sometimes you're going to be able to tutor as well so where do you play this card in standard most obviously it works pretty well in like mono black shieldred shells pretty bad if your opponent has shielded but if you have shielded you can cast this three mana draw three sure you lose three life but shieldred's going to trigger three times so you actually end up gaining life when you cast this card so i could see this showing up in like standard mono black maybe gold gary or racto something like that once you get back to like pioneer then i think this could be a mono black devotion card so the downside in mono black devotion is insatiable avarice is not a permanent that adds black mana symbols but in small numbers i think this could still be worth it so you probably have nick those to make tons of black mana so triple black not a big deal and then a lot of the black devotion decks we've played in like pioneer or historic recently are actually kind of combo decks like yeah you can just win by playing a bunch of gray merchants and winning fairly but a lot of times you have like pure into the abyss is a one of to go with underworld reeves and you find your parent of the best and you cast it and just burn your opponent out of the game and insatiable avarice is going to be perfect in a deck like that you can cast it on turn three if you need to just to smooth out your draws you can use it to find nykthos if you need to in the early game and then in the late game when you have tons of mana because your devotion's high you just use it fully powered to tutor up your combo piece draw the extra cards and win the game on the spot i can even see it showing up in modern maybe in like mono black coffers the problem i see here is like the one rings just kind of taken over mono black coffers in modern there's been times when like knight's whisper has been played in mono black coffers but now it's pretty much just a one ring deck so that might be the issue like why play insatiable avarice if you have a one ring that just draws even more cards and time walks your opponent so we'll have to see if the one ring eventually ends up getting banned or the meta shifts or maybe even right now is like a one of or something coffers is the kind of deck that can take advantage of this we're tutoring up your one ring or your card to get your one ring or whatever and drawing some cards along the way once you get to commander this card is just kind of ridiculous any deck that can consistently make three black mana I want this card in it for me three mana draw threes are some of the best card draw effects in commander i'm not a big fan of like two mana draw twos but once you get to three mana draw threes i'm a big fan you're getting two extra cards in your hand for only three mana so if you're playing essentially any mono black deck or even maybe some multicolor decks where you have urborg to make sure you have all the black mana basically if you can cast this consistently even with the triple black cost of paying its second spree mode then this card is just an easy inclusion in your deck is one of your card draw slots plus you get the tutor mode in the late game so insatiable avarice I absolutely love this card I think this card's great I think you can see standard play definitely gonna be an all-star in commander and probably even has a little bit of a chance in formats like modern and pioneer plus the spree mechanics just super cool I know it's just another kicker mechanic and every mechanics kicker and all that stuff but really 
kicker is a great mechanic. That's why every mechanic is kicker is because kicker is really fun to play with because it gives you choices and flexibility. So big fan of the spree mechanic, big fan of insatiable avarice. We also got a pretty ridiculous enchantment in Veraska joins up. So Veraska joins up two mana gold Gary legendary enchantment. When it ETBs, you put a death touch counter on each creature you control. And then most importantly, when a legendary creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you get to draw a card and notice the way that's worded you're going to draw a card for each legendary creature. So if you hit opponents with three legends, you draw three cards, five legends, you draw five cards. It's not just one card, no matter how many legends you hit with. So the first mode on this card, the death touch, it's nice. It allows your small creatures to trade up. Synergizes really well with big tramplers. Trample and death touch, obviously your opponent really can't block your stuff well because you just assign one damage, trample the rest over to your opponent's face. So there is some value there. And I think you can get use out of it that way. What I'm mostly excited about though is the last mode it's essentially like a Toski or coastal piracy or a biden athasa the staply card draw effects in commander except just two mana so of course there is a downside it only triggers on legendary creatures so if your plan is like i'm gonna make a bunch of tokens and try to draw a ton of cards Veraska joins up isn't gonna work there but remember it's 2024 like half the creatures that are printed these days are legends and a lot of decks are playing a lot of legends naturally just because wizards is printing so many of them so it's actually gonna trigger way more often Often than you think so think about standard like golgarian standard yes it is true that your deep cavern bat or preacher of the schism or mosswood red knight isn't really gonna benefit from Veraska joins up i mean the death touch is nice i guess but it's not gonna draw you cards on the other hand glissa is a legend gix is a legend lord skitter is a legend shielder is a legend aklazos is a legend and these are just cards that are commonly played this isn't like i'm trying to build my deck to power up Veraska joins up this is just like i jam this in tier golgari many of your creatures are incidentally going to be legends that are going to work with Veraska joins up so that I think might be enough for it to see play by itself of course we also get a ton of like legendary theme decks that's kind of been one of the big pushes in the last couple of years is to make legendary matters actually matter so we've seen like Jota decks in standard which are all legends we've seen some slogger like four or five color legendary decks if you're playing a deck that's themed around legends in specific Veraska joins up is going to be great there it's going to draw you so many cards also really Really good with slogger i mean it works with the plan of like the legendary slogger channel land thing plus slogger is really big and really trampoly so once you add a death touch counter to it it's just gonna one shot opponents super quickly in commander it really depends on the amount of legends you have, right? I could see some just like random Golgari decks being able to play this because you have enough legends in your deck. But worst case, it seems just like an all-star for any sort of legend deck, Jota, Sisse, Kethis. The other way you could take advantage of this, which is kind of cute, is trying to use the death touch mode with pingers. Like imagine putting a death touch counter on Scattershot Archer, which just taps to deal one damage to each creature with flying. This just like rasps all the flyers every single turn by tapping itself once it has death touch. Or like, is it static caster? to deal one damage to a creature but if it has death touch that one damage is going to take the creature down so Golgari is kind of like an awkward color for a pinger deck but if you can make the colors work it's really good there as well also i didn't mention this but it's good with like bite effects the fighting but your creature doesn't take damage like your small creatures with death touch are going to take down all your opponent's big things so Veraska joins up this card's actually kind of ridiculous. Yes, it's a little restricted. You're going to need a bunch of legends in your deck. But if you meet that requirement, a two-mana coastal piracy that also has additional upside of giving all your things that are on the battlefield when it comes into play death touch is a ridiculous card for just two mana. Next up, we got a new Satoru in Satoru the Infiltrator. And this card is actually pretty cute. So before we talk about the card, I gotta say, shout out to the Wanted posters. Really like this card style. One of my criticisms of some past card styles is they just weren't special enough. If I open a card style, I wanna know I open something special, something rare, something that might be valuable. And I think the Wanted posters do this really well. They just stand out so well. So if you crack this in a pack, you're immediately gonna know I got something good. You're not going to be like, oh, is the border extended a little bit? Did they erase a little bit of this to make this a special card? No, it's new art. It's obvious. So well done on the wanted posters. But Satoru itself, this card is sweet. So two mana, two, three, legendary human ninja rogue. The text line, getting a little cluttered these days with creature types, has menace. And it says when it and or one or more other non-token creatures enter the battlefield under your control, if none of them were cast or no mana was spent to cast them, draw a card. So the question is, 
how do you trigger this ability? How are we playing non-token creatures without spending mana, without casting them? So obviously you can reanimate something. You Cruelty of Grixia, your Atroxa, you draw an extra card with Saturu, but that can't be the purpose of this card. And I think the idea of this card is to be a plot card. So when I first saw plot, and I think I mentioned this before, I was kind of skeptical. I was like, why would I spend all the mana on my card, but not get my card? Why do I delay it? Why would I want to suspend it for a turn if I could just play my creature and attack with it and block with it right now? But it turns out stuff like Saturu gives you a payoff. So you can use Flibblefip or Jace or whatever other plot stuff we get. You get a bunch of creatures that are plotted. Then you play Saturu. Then you can play all those plot cards for free since you didn't spend any mana on those cards. Every creature ET being will draw you a card with Saturu. The other thing I love about this card, it does work with like Breakout and Collective Company, other ways to cheat creatures into play. But it also works with ninjutsu. So they took this ninja character, Saturu. They managed to make it a plot card, but it still works with ninjas too. Because if you ninjutsu something, like a ninja that e powers or a thousand face shadow, you're having a non token creature enter the battlefield, but you're not spending mana to cast it. Even though you gotta spend mana on the ninjutsu, that's not casting, it's a separate ability. So that'll trigger Saturu. So if you ninja the e powers, you're gonna start drawing more cards now. And remember, we still have some ninjas in standard because of Kamigawa. So maybe Satoru revitalizes ninjas in the last few months before Kamigawa finally rotates on top of also helping with the plot stuff. My favorite idea for this card, and it is a horrible, horrible, horrible idea, but to build a Cheerios deck with this card. So a long time ago, we played this legacy deck that was Glimpse of Nature. Whenever you cast a creature spell, you draw a card. And all the creatures in the deck were zero mana creatures, ornithopters, various kobolds, memnites. And the idea was you just like mulligan a glimpse of nature then you just chain together free spells and kind of storm off and eventually get a couple lotus petals and a grape shot or whatever and just storm your opponent out of the game with damage Saturo seems perfect for this archetype this is like another backup glimpse of nature every time we cast an ornithopter or a kobold or a memnite no mana was spent to cast them so we get to draw a card with Saturo. so this is a redundant combo piece so the deck is horrible it is not good it is not gonna win it is very much an against the odds deck but it is so hilarious when it goes off it's Saturo is perfect support there as well so Satur the infiltrator I really like this card it's a cute little design got a bunch of synergies works with ninjas works with plot and enables some janky combos we also got a very scary bird wizard in slick shot show off so two mana one two flying haste whenever you cast a non-creature spell it gets plus two plus zero until end of turn and you can plot it for two mana so why would you plot a slick shot show off and the answer is you can get some extra damage out of it. If you think about this card, this is essentially like a Storm Chaser Mage, almost mixed with a Flying Kiln Fiend, getting Super Prowess plus two plus zero for every nine creature spell you cast. So that can deal a lot of damage. We have seen Kiln Fiend one-shot people like crazy. It's pretty easy to play a Kiln Fiend, wait until it loses Summoning Sickness, and give it double strike, cast enough spells to make it 10 power, one-shot kill your opponent. Slick Shot Show Off can kind of do the same thing, even better in some ways since it has flying and the plot really really helps with that plan because what you can do is rather than just running out your slick shot show off on turn two let's say and you hit your opponent for one hasty damage you can plot it on turn two and then on turn three you can play it for free and then you have all your mana up to spell pierce to protect it to cast pump spells to get in damage and you just have this huge turn and kill your opponent so i think this card will certainly see standard play it works so well with monstrous rage and play with fire whether you just run it out and hit for one and play it like a real creature or if you plot it and try to set up for this big combo turn and it works really well in the tier mono red shell we already have monastery swift spear we already have fugitive code breaker these prowess effects slick shot show off cares about the same things the deck can already support this you're already playing kimono faces kazan all those other spells we're talking about so i think that this card easily certainly definitely has a home in mono red in standard i think this just slots right in right away and it's going to be incredibly powerful in that deck i also think this card will see play in pioneer and probably historic as well so in historic uh, is it Wizards? His long been one of the top decks in the format. Just be super aggressive, prowessy, soul scar mage, Belmore, Wizards, Lightning. Slick Shot Show Off seems like another great wizard addition to that deck. It's a wizard to turn on your Wizards Lightning, plus getting plus two plus zero for every spell you cast. Just turns it into a really fast clock, and you can do the plot trick we were talking about before. So Slick Shot Show Off. 
It might not look super flashy or anything, it's really just a super efficient red beater, but I love the use of plot here. It actually really powers up the card, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot of this card in aggro decks, in standard, and maybe even outside of standard. Speaking of scary red cards, we also got a new Magda in Magda the Horde Master. So 2 mana 2-2, two -two, Legendary Dwarf Berserker, says whenever you commit a crime, create a tap treasure token only triggers one cheat's turn. So if you target your opponent with anything or any of their stuff with anything, you get a tap treasure. That's not the exciting ability, although it is nice. If you do a bunch of crime and you get a bunch of treasure, I guess that's kind of a flavor win until you go to jail at least. Uh, but the big payoff here is you can sack three treasures to make a 4-4 red scorpion dragon creature token with flying in haste only as a sorcery. So what makes me excited about Magda is getting three treasures on the battlefield is pretty easy like not only do you have magda that can do some criming to make some treasures but look at standard charming scoundrel collector's vault gala greeters treasure map black market tycoon big score it's sushi great train heist there are so many cards that just make treasures it seems pretty possible to build a mono red deck a gruel deck that's gonna get three or four or five or six treasures on the battlefield and then you just drop magda and make a couple of hasty four four flyers and smash your opponent to death in a couple of turns to win the game so in a deck that can make a lot of treasures magda is kind of an absurd payoff thanks to the haste on those dragons that it makes we also got a card that I just mentioned with Magda in Great Train Heist. And this is another card. So many cards in this set just seem so powerful to me. This is another card that seems very powerful. So it's another spree card. So it's one red mana plus some combination of two and a red to untap all creatures you control. If it's your combat phase, there's an additional combat phase after this phase, plus two generic to give creatures you can tow plus one plus zero in first strike until end of turn, or plus one red to choose an opponent whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to that player this turn create a tap treasure token so we're just talking about making a bunch of treasures for magda great train heist for two red mana can make it so every time you deal combat damage to a player this turn you get a treasure for each of them which is a ridiculous amount of treasures to support magda sure they're tapped so you can't like use them right away but still that by itself is a pretty strong effect but it's so much better than that when you think about this card it's essentially a relentless assault a card that already has seen some playing commander kind of a classic old rare where for four mana you get an additional combat phase but it's also a rally the forces where for three mana you give your team first strike and plus one plus zero until end of turn and then also for two mana can make all your team into prosperous thefts so when you deal combat damage you're making a tap treasure token if you add all this together you get a really frightening and flexible card where this can be everything from double red to make treasures to four mana to take an extra combat step to a bunch of mana to do all those things at once and just have this huge turn so i love the flexibility of the spree mechanic and i think this card is really good imagine in standard we got the boros deck right you got the boros deck that's just flooding the board super quickly with creatures novice inspector and then blow up the token and gleeful demolition to make three one ones in warden of the inner sky the deck puts so many bodies on the battlefield so fast that you can realistically like on turn two be making like four treasure tokens with great train heist even better if you wait a little bit you can be taking multiple combats imagine how easy it's going to be to close out the game when you're taking multiple combats with this huge swarm of boros tokens so it seems really really good there the other trick with this card and we mentioned this a little bit with the spree wrap but it works with isochron scepter so you put it under Isochron Scepter, and you can just be doing this every turn, taking extra combats every turn, making treasures every turn. But it gets even better with Great Train Heist. As a one mana red instant, you can get it with Sunforger, which is actually true of the Wrath as well. I probably should have mentioned that during the Wrath section. It's a Sunforgerable Wrath, which is kind of ridiculous. But this is a Sunforger target. Since it only costs a single red mana, you can get the Great Train Heist with the Sunforger, and then you can pay the additional cost from it to get the extra modes on it. So this is a way that you can tutor this up pretty consistently and i should say this is assuming the rules work the way we think they do we haven't got the full official rulings yet assuming spree works like kicker and other similar mechanics you should be able to do all these tricks so kind of assuming this is how it works based on other similar mechanics but watsi hasn't explicitly said okay these are the actual like nuts and bolts rulings on spree but you should be able to sun forger it out and get an extra combat that way which makes it a very exciting commander card so i think in commander 
outside of the shenanigans we were just talking about, it's going to be at its best in decks that want to attack a lot. Wolf Gear, Ishin, Ilharg, anything that's all about attacking and doubling up those triggers and getting value out of attacking with your commander. Four mana for an extra combat step is pretty much the going rate. Right? That's a pretty efficient extra combat step. And then you get all these other upsides as well. So great train heist. Another really powerful spree card that I think has ramifications definitely in Commander and maybe in Standard as well. We also got <laughs> maybe the scariest equipment and uh, most likely to get you killed equipment that I've ever seen. The key to the vault. So the key to the vault. One in a blue for a legendary equipment. Doesn't buff your creatures anything like that. You can equip it for three. All it does is when a crypt creature deals combat damage to a player, you look at that many cards from the top of your library and you may exile a non-land card from among them and put the rest on the bottom and then you can cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So what this means is when you hit your opponent, you're going to get to cast something for free free if you hit your opponent with a big creature you're gonna see more cards but really you should be able to stack your deck if you build around this to be able to cast something super game ending an emerkel an omniscient something is just gonna close out the game and this can be happening super early in the game thanks to the efficiency of key to the vault so i'm imagining you play like an invisible stalker some evasive and resilient creature because you know once you start trying to equip this your opponents are gonna kill it because they are gonna have the fear like the idea of you casting something for free from the top of your deck is is going to make you a huge huge target so keep that in mind if you're going to try to pull this off expect to be arch enemy expect to be arch enemy as soon as this hits the battlefield when i see a key of the vault hit the battlefield i'm going to be like oh no i got to deal with that person because they're probably going to pop off and win this game somehow but imagine putting the key to the vault on the invisible stalker so you know you can get in the attack and then you can use something like brainstorm or vampiric tutor set up the top of your deck so you know you're going to have that omniscience or that emerkel not in commander because emerkel's mad but you know what I'm saying? A huge thing. You could do that in modern. You could do it with Emrakul. But you put your big finisher on the top of the deck. You get in that attack and you just cast it for free with Key to the Vault. It is a ridiculously scary card. So as far as homes for this, I actually think something Wizards did for Commander that was really sneaky is they made this a blue card. Because I was reading this, I was like, hmm, does it have to be blue? What really makes this a blue card? And I think the answer is blue is not the best equipment color. If you look at equipment in Commander, mono white, mono red, boros, that's kind of the wheelhouse of equipment decks. There's not as many blue based equipment decks. So I think being blue actually helps power this card down a little bit. If this was colorless or if this was like a white card or a red card, it would be incredibly frightening because boros equipment such a powerful archetype. But I think that there's still homes for this probably the best home is actually isha tanaka armorer so isha five mana two four legendary human artificer when it attacks you can look at the top four cards of your library you can put any number of artifact cards with mana value equal or less to its power onto the battlefield the rest on the bottom of your library tapped whatever so it can dig for your key to the vault the big thing is it can't be blocked as long as defending player controls three or more artifacts so in commander everyone's playing mana rock so a point having three or more artifacts pretty likely so this gives you a commander that can not only dig for the key to the vault but also also is going to most likely be unblockable to make sure you get in the hit with the key to the vault so you can play your omniscience or whatever huge game ending finish you have to win the game but really if you're playing any equipment deck that has blue in it like tetsuko or galea i think this card's in the conversation is it good I do have a fear that it's going to get you killed. Like I said before, the biggest concern I have with this card is it's just so scary that once it hits the battlefield, I think you become immediately the target. But I do think it's a really, really powerful effect, especially in Commander. In one view, when there's so much removal, I imagine a lot of times it's going to be against the odds to actually make it pop off. You're going to like get it set up and get the equipment down and your opponent just fatal pushes and you cry yourself to sleep. But in Commander, you got three opponents. Maybe you can play a whatever Grand Abolisher or something to make sure your opponent can't interact and then you just hit him and pop off and win the game so key to the vault really interesting and scary equipment just keep in mind you're probably going to be arch enemy when you play it because people are going to be really afraid that it's going to win the game we also got tiny bones joins up we saw this for a minute earlier one black mana legendary enchantment when it enters a battlefield, any number of target players each discard a card. And when a legendary creature enters a battlefield under your control, any number of target players each mill a card and lose a life. So when I first saw this card, I was kind of meh on it, but I think I figured this card out. So what this card does is it's essentially like 
a hopeless nightmare, more or less, where it ETBs, you can make people discard, and then when legends enter the battlefield, you can mill someone, make them lose a life, uh, tiny bones, other cheap legends like that. You could build some sort of, like, combo deck with this, where you try to, like, mill a bunch of legends and reanimate them and drain your opponent out of the game. That would be pretty cute. It's funny when Norna the Wary is a legend that keeps blinking, so it's going to be entering the battlefield a lot, but I think the idea of this card is it's just a really good crime enabler. Like, you play this, it is going to commit a crime the turn it comes into play, because you're going to target your opponents with its ETB trigger to make them discard a card, so that's going to trigger all your crime stuff. More importantly, every time a legendary creature enters the battlefield, you're going to commit another crime, right? You're going to target whatever players you want to make them mill a card and lose a life. So even if you're not able to win the game with this or combo off with this, this is just in a deck that's got a bunch of legendary outlaws. This is just going to make sure that you're committing a crime and committing a crime and committing a crime each and every turn whenever you need to, to power up your geeses and your magdas and all your other payoffs for committing a crime. So I think that's the purpose of this card. In the context of being like a combo card or a payoff or whatever, I think it's pretty mediocre. But in the context of I need to commit a lot of crimes, it's actually a pretty sweet option. We also got a green card that literally made my jaw drop when I saw it. This card is so power creepy. Whether it matters because it's green and standard, we'll have to wait and see. But the power creep on this card is so obvious. So that is Colossal Rattleworm. It is a 4 mana 6-5. It has flash if you control a desert. It has trample, and then you can pay one in a green, exile it from your graveyard, search your library for a desert, put it on the battlefield, tab to shuffle. This card is an absurd, absurd, absurd threat. So as far as I can tell, there has never been a four mana six five in Magic that didn't have a significant downside. Four mana six fives cost five mana. That's where you see Springleaf Avenger, Oyer Kaslam, Battle Mammoth. But this is way better than this. As long as you have a desert, which if you're playing this, you should probably have a desert because that's kind of the gimmick, right? Uh, but as long as you have a desert, you can flash this in, which kind of makes it like a green removal spell. Your opponent attacks you, you have four mana up, you just flash in this six, five blocker to eat whatever your opponent's attacking with. So this is probably going to come down and eat a creature right away. And then you get in an attack or two. Your opponent's life total is going to drop quickly. And then if your opponent does manage to kill it, well, okay, I guess I'll pay two, exile it from my graveyard, and rampant growth and desert into play. So it ends up being a ramp spell as well. This card is so off the charts. It's like they forgot to put an extra mana on it or something. Like, it's wild to me just how far above the curve this card is. Uh, the only downside, there's two downsides. So one downside is, so far, the only deserts we've seen in Standard are like these common tap deserts, which have uses. They commit crimes somehow. Our lands even commit crime in uh, Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Uh, but we haven't seen a ton of playable deserts. So we'll have to wait and see if we get more and better deserts in this set. If we do, Colossal Rattleworm goes up even further in value. I guess even without a ton of good deserts, you play a couple for the ramp mode. But if you can't flash it in, I guess it's still fine. My only other concern for this card is, like, green just hasn't been very good in standard, so we can we find a home for this card. But other than those concerns, this card is just absolutely wild. It literally made my draw job. When I was reading through this card, I was looking for the drawback. There's got to be a drawback, right? You don't just make a 4-mana 6-5 flash trampler that then also ramps you after it dies. That can't be a thing, but it is a thing, and it exists, and that's Colossal Rattleworm. Next up, we got a, another mount in Fortune Loyal Steed. So 3 mana 2 for Legendary Beast Mount. When ATBs you scry to, and when it attacks while saddled, at end of combat, you exile it, and up to one target creature that saddled it, return those guards to the battlefield under their owner's control, and you saddle for one. So Fortune... I'm actually kind of meh on this card. So it's cute with Panharmonicons, right? It's a blink effect. So it ETBs and scries too, so you can dig for your Panharmonicon. And then if you saddle it and attack, you need to blink something and reuse your ETBs with Delny or Panharmonicon or Elish Norn. The problem I see with this card is it's kind of got the like mysterious limousine or golden Argosy problem, which is to get value out of its blink effect, you need to be able to attack with a 2-4 and have it survive combat. If your opponent just kills it, you're not 
really gonna get to do the thing like i guess you'll still get to exile the thing that saddled it because it's a delayed trigger but you're just like chump attacking your fortune so you're getting one blink out of it for three mana which just doesn't seem that good so that's kind of the problem i see with this card if you can pop off with it and like make it unblockable or keep forcing it through to attack every turn it will snowball its value immensely because remember it exiles itself too so you're gonna get to scry two again to dig for the action you need you're gonna blink a i don't know something value a spirited companion and draw more cards the one place i am excited about this though is i've had this deck i've been working on i haven't really got it right yet but i really want to build this cloak deck with vanifar and non-valved enigma and cryptic coat with the idea being you use like vanifar cryptic coat to try to cloak portal to frexius one with the multiverses the biggest baddest permanence that we have in standard and then all you got to do is blink the cloak permanent to get the real side of the card and fortune i think would actually be worth it in that deck because it comes into play in screen rise to try to set up the top of your deck for like cryptic code or find a card to cloak for vanifar and then sure fortune's probably gonna attack once and die to a shielded or something but that's fine because if i'm flipping to a portal of phyrexia or a one with the multiverse i don't really need fortune anymore i'm kind of fine with it being a one-shot effect in that case so i'm certainly interested in playing it there in commander i think i try it in blink decks like preston or braga or rune i think it does get a little better in commander because in commander you got three opponents rather than just one opponent like in standard or other constructed formats so you can try to attack whoever doesn't have any blockers so i think it's a little easier to get in attacks with it in a format like commander so it might be worth it in a blink style deck but fortune it's a really sweet card it's got cool synergies it works with banner monocons i just worry that it's not going to be able to attack as often as i need it to also why is it legendary does this card really need to be legendary wizards we also got free strider lookout this one's pretty simple three mana three three human rogue so it is a criminal or a outlaw it has reach and it says when you commit a crime look at the top five cards of your library you can put a land card from among them on the battlefield tap the rest on the bottom in a random order this ability only triggers once each turn so free strider lookout it is elvish rejuvenator every time you commit a crime once each turn actually kind of a sweet ramp effect like a three mana three three reach isn't bad stats and then if you can repeatedly do some criming this is going to do a lot of ramping the other upside of these effects the downside is of course so you can whiff with them if you have no lands in your top five you're a little bit sad that shouldn't happen too much but it will happen on occasion the upside is it can grab non-basic land so it's not restricted to basic land so interesting ramp effects that i think could definitely see constructed play next up we got some big score cards so big score was gonna be march of the machines aftermath for outlaws at thunder junction but aftermath flopped so hard because watsy tried to sell five card backs for full price the wizards decided to reverse course and they just moved the cards into the main set which good on wizards i would much rather get these cards for free and normal boosters and have to pay high prices for five card boosters uh, so these are going to show up in the list slot in boosters for outlaws at thunder junction which means about one in every five packs you'll get a big score card in your pack which is cool otherwise they're exactly the same as cards in the main set they're standard legal commander legal modern legal all that stuff they just have a different set symbol and a different set name so card number one from the big score sheet ultic matter weaver three mana two four it's a human artificer it says whenever you cast a creature spell choose one create a one one colorless gnome artifact creature token or create a token that's a copy of target artifact token you control so this is kind of like a monastery mentor for creatures which i guess means it's literally a torrens fist of the angel which good news and bad news so torrens i was actually really high on i thought it would be pretty good you just drop the three drop and sling some creatures and make a bunch of tokens didn't actually end up working out it actually still exists in standard so we can play both of these cards together right now if we want to i actually forgot torrens was even legal because i just haven't seen it in like two and a half years or whatever but ultic matter weaver does have an upside which is it has four toughness it's also not legendary so you can stack up multiples of them which i think means this is meaningfully stronger than torrents so if you want to play some sort of creature slinger style deck this seems like a legit option it does seem to work well in some sort of human shell it is a human so you can play this with your novice inspectors and jarinas and copper coat vanguards seems like an easy fit there the other weird part about this card is the making a copy of an artifact token so i think the idea of this is it lets you make copies of treasure tokens or clue 
tokens or food tokens or blood tokens, which could be relevant. It also kind of makes it a unique build around. Like there's a world where you can like make a token copy of Portal to Phyrexia with a Jenga tag seen this or a Drafna or a Sahili. And then once you have a token copy of it, every time you cast a creature, you just get another one for free with Ultic Matter Weaver, which is kind of ridiculous. That's probably more of like a fun against the odds plan than a real competitive plan, but it does sound hilarious if you can pull it off. So Ultic Matter Weaver, definitely worth keeping in mind. I could see this showing up in a human's deck in standard. The ability to go really wide with tokens is nice. Could even show up in some of the Boros style decks. So definitely a powerful card and I think the best version of this creature slinger effect we've seen so far. We also got transmutational font. So five mana artifact, tap it to make your choice of a blood, a clue, or a food token. And then you can pay three, sack three artifact tokens with different names, search your library for an artifact card, put it on the battlefield, and then shuffle only as a sorcery. So transmutational font, Another way to cheat big artifacts into play, Portal to Phyrexia, Blightsteel, or whatever, it works with all those same token types we were just talking about, bloods and foods and clues and treasures and uh, all that stuff. It also works with, like, the gnome tokens that Ultic Matter Weaver makes. It works with Might tokens. That would be another differently named artifact token. The only question I have for this card is... Ah, it seems kind of slow, right? Like, the best artifact you can get in standard, I think, is Portal to Phyrexia, discounting some sort of, like, combo. But just the biggest, baddest artifact is Portal to Phyrexia. If you really think about it, for Transmutational Front to get Portal to Phyrexia, you gotta pay five to cast it, and then you gotta pay three more and sack three artifact tokens. So you're paying eight total mana to get a nine mana artifact. It is nice. You are tutoring it out, so it is finding it and generating card advantage. But it's actually not a huge discount. And until you start tutoring out artifacts a five man artifact that just like taps to make a clue or a flute or a blood not super exciting to me it does work really well with academy manufacturer like you're tapping this and just getting all kinds of clues and foods and treasures out of it making plenty of artifact tokens to sacrifice and turn it on and tutor stuff out so it seems very powerful there and there are certain commander decks where this seems really good like bernard is really good at making these weird artifact tokens Burdeclad, an artifact deck about tokens Gimbal, another artifact deck about tokens. The Third Doctor, another card that cares about clues and foods and treasures. So I think there are certainly uses for this card. My guess is it's mostly a card for artifact commander decks, but it could be a build around for standard. I'd be surprised if it was like truly competitive in standard, but we'll have to wait and see. We also got Vaultborn Tyrant. Why is there a dinosaur in the vault? I have no idea, but here we are. So Vaultborn Tyrant, seven mana, six, six. It's a dinosaur, it is trample. Whenever it or another creature with power four or greater enters the battlefield under your control, you gain three life and you draw a card. Pretty powerful effect, right? So seven mana, six, six, trample, ETBs, draws the cards, gain three life. And if other big creatures ETB, you draw more cards and gain more life. And then if it dies, if it's not a token, create a token that's a copy of it, except it's an artifact in addition to its other type so it's actually resilient to a removal spell the first time it dies you get another copy of it that's an artifact my question for this card i think it's really powerful is it as powerful as the other finishers in standard at seven mana that's like the sweet spot for the win the game cards a tally primal conqueror atroxa grand unifier titan of industry is Vaultborn Tyrant on that list? Is this another one of those finishers where if you're ramping into things, cheating things into play, this is an option you want to play? And I think the answer is it ranks below the other three of these cards, but I think it's still very powerful. It's just very hard to complete with Italian Atroxa. And then Titan of Industry is just better if you need to gain life, I think. Like it clogs up the board a little bit better immediately. The other concern I have for Vaultborn Tyrant is it does line up pretty poorly with Exile Re removal i guess that's kind of true of titan of industry as well but volborn tyrant if your opponent's killing it with go for the throw you're pretty happy because you just get another one in token form the first time it dies but if there's sun falling and wrathing your entire board it's just gonna be gone forever so i think that Vaultborn tyrant if it has a chance in standard it's probably not gonna be out of the troxa and itali in the generic ramp decks or domain decks but it does seem sweet in dinosaur decks so if the creature type of dinosaur matters maybe you're like hasting things in with Pliny hatcher or whatever then i could see this being a pretty sweet option it's also kind of hilarious with galta like if you can galta and dump a ton of big creatures into play you're gonna
going to gain a lot of life and draw a lot of cards with Vaultborn Tyrant. So I feel like Vaultborn Tyrant, at a minimum, really nice addition to Dinosaur Commander decks. Like, it's a source of card advantage. You're full of big dinosaurs. It has some protection from removal. So if you're playing Gishath or uh, Palanza or Zakama, I think this is a very easy inclusion in the top end of your curve. It's also kind of cute with some cheating to play stuff. Like, if you sneak attack this, it'll come into play. You'll draw a card. You'll gain some life. It'll die in your end step. You'll get the token copy. You'll draw another card. You'll gain some more life. Uh, so that seems sweet. Flash if it was legal, which means it's also like a good Henzy card in Commander where you can blitz this into play, smash your opponent, generate card advantage, gain life, and then get the token copy anyway. So Vaultborn Tyrant. The card's really sweet. I think it's just a notch below, like, the Italia Troxa tier, but it's still a very powerful 7-mana effect that does pretty much everything you want to do with a big finisher. We also got one pretty important reprint in big score which is torpor orb so torpor orb just stops etb triggers from triggering one thing we have seen in standard is atroxa and Atali being really good the only problem i have with this is it only stops creature etbs this is kind of a outdated version of the effect which means in the matchup you want this most which is going to be the atroxa Atali like domain matchup your opponent can still just leyline binding to get rid of the torpor orb and then do their big thing but it is a very useful hate card that i think will serve a purpose especially if domain and itali and atroxa remain at the top of the meta so i'm glad this card exists in standard i think it'll be useful it's going to be around for pretty much three years so this will be a sideboard card at some point but it's not as hard of a sideboard card as it could possibly be also so far every single thing we've seen from big score is a mythic uh, at first i was like oh like torpor orbit mythic feels really bad what are you doing wizards but it might be a case where just everything in big score has the mythic set symbol so we'll have to wait and see if just everything's a mythic in the big score set then they get a pass for this being a mythic but if there are lower rarity cards Ah, this should really be a rare at a minimum. Moving on to some cycles. So land-wise, the rest of the fast lands are returning. Pretty good reprints, actually. Spire Bluff Canal in specific, pretty expensive. These cards, bad for Arena, because it's going to be duplicate copies for a lot of people that already got them from past sets, but good reprints for paper, and it completes the cycle for standard. So not like fetch lands or some super hyped high end you know super exciting land cycle but a pretty reasonable land cycle and i'm glad we're getting more of them gonna be helpful for pioneer where they're kind of stables and help get the prices down on some of the more expensive of these cards we also mentioned some of these as we we're going along but we got the full 10 card cycle of the crime desert so they etb tapped their deserts uh they make a mana of two colors and when they etb it deals one damage to target opponent I don't think you play these cards just to deal a damage to an opponent, but if your deck really cares about committing a crime, these are lands that target your opponent, so they're lands that commit a crime. So I think that's the main use of these cards. Plus, I'm always going to be happy about slightly powered up common land cycles. I think that's something we need more of in Magic. So these aren't staples, they still ETB tapped, but they certainly do have some uses. We also got our special guest for Outlaws at Thunder Junction. So if you don't remember special guests, this is another special slot in these packs. These are all reprints. They're not standard legal, but they're reprints that get art based on the theme of the set. The most interesting aspect of these cards is they do change legality on Arena in specific, because some of these cards are going to be new to Arena for the first time. Uh, many of them already exist. They're Brazen Bar or Escape Shift or whatever. But I think the big ones are Stoneforge Mystic. That is a card that certainly has ramifications for formats like Timeless, for formats like Historic. It sees a lot of modern play and legacy play. It's just proven itself to be an eternal staple. No Batter Skull to tutor up, no Cauldron Complete to tutor up. So I'm not sure exactly what we're tutoring up with our Stoneforge. Worst case, I've tried to make like Hammer Time work in Historic and in Timeless, and you just don't really have all the pieces. Stoneforge might be the missing piece to maybe make some sort of Timeless Hammer Time deck of thing. Notion Thief, new to Arena, super annoying. Don't want to talk about it. The other card I do want to talk about those prismatic vista so we only have half the fetches on arena right now prismatic vista is the best fetch outside of the original fetch cycle so it only gets a basic but
putting it any basic it comes into play on tap the land comes into play on tap so it's like the super rare very powerful version of evolving wilds but in a format like timeless where blood moon is a thing you run into being able to fetch out a basic actually has a lot of value so another really solid reprint there the rest of the stuff i don't know scape shift has uses brazen bar has uses mystic snake i mean the flavor is really good i figured there'd have to be a rattlesnake in this set desert one of the worst cards of all time but <laughs> The flavor is really good. So some flavorful reprints and a few good new cards for Arena. We also have one other special sheet in Breaking News. So Breaking News is basically Outlaws of Thunder Junction's version of like Strixhaven Mystical Archives or Brothers War Retro Artifacts. All reprints, none of the cards change legality as far as format. So they're not going to be standard legal or anything like that. Although some of these cards will be new to Arena for the first time. And I think the big takeaways here really i mean there's there's one mana drain mana drain really expensive like a 50 dollars card commander staple i'm actually super curious if they add that to arena i think last time we did this wizards replaced like three of the cards on the sheet and didn't put them on arena i'm very curious if mana drain actually gets on arena i think that if it does, it certainly is going to be banned in Historic. I expect it will be immediately restricted in Timeless. And my bigger fear is, I feel like it's just an annoying Historic Brawl card. Historic Brawl is a pretty fun format, but I don't know if I want someone to be like, oh, Mana Drain, your thing. I make 10 extra mana and win the game. Like, it kind of works in Commander because you have three people that can team up on the Mana Drain player. But in a 1v1 format, Mana Drain make like five or six extra mana, dump your hand. That's going to put someone really, really far ahead. Otherwise, like Oko's, a pretty sweet reprint. The art looks cool. Grindstone, another pretty expensive reprint, 20, 30 bucks. It doesn't really have many uses outside of Painter Servant decks, and we don't really have Painter Servant legal on Arena yet, but if Painter Servant ever shows up, it's going to be really good. A uh, Path to Exile, also new to Arena. And then Dust Bowl, not a good card, but a very annoying card where you can blow up one of your opponent's non-basics each and every turn. We also got the four Commander face cards from the set. So I'm not going to go in depth on these. This is already been an incredibly long video but i did want to say tomer's going to be covering all this stuff over on the mtg goldfish commander youtube so if you want to hear more about the commander precons once they're out and the face commanders stella lee yuma ganti and olivia make sure to go over to mtg goldfish commander youtube finally today in the realm of lower rarity cards and we're going to keep this quick because this has been a long video we got lava spur boots which is one man equipment gives equip creature plus one plus zero haste in ward one and it equips for one so this is essentially bad swift foot boots or bad lightning greaves the protection just isn't strong enough to beat out these cards in a commander deck but it is notable because it's one mana which means you can find it with urza saga you can trinket mage it up so even though it's not as good as like these staply protective equipments that we see in commander i still think it has uses just because that one mana mana cost is actually relevant in some ways we also got holy cow which <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't resist they just couldn't resist making a holy cow joke it definitely feels like an unset card but it's actually not that bad they i was watching the stream and they said they gave it flash because if you flash it in the player might be like holy cow oh wadzi but it's a three mana two two flying flash and when etbs you gain two life and scry one i couldn't limit it at least as far as good lore rarity cards scorching shot really good at killing shielded in specific make your own luck intrigues me for five mana you look at the top three cards of your library and you can exile a non-land card from among them and plot it and put the rest into your hand so for five mana you draw three but you get to plot one of those cards so if you can set that omniscience or emmer or something on the top of your deck you can plot that and then the next turn cast it for free which is kind of ridiculous we also got a ton of gold kind of signposts on commons most of them legendary ruthless lawbringers not for some reason uh but these cards all seem pretty interesting if you're looking for lower rarity commanders to build around and some of them might see a bit of standard play as well finally there's just a ton of other stuff and honestly not all of it's that bad a lot of it's going to be rounding out limited formats and stuff but we've just talked about so many cards there's no way we can go through every common and uncommon so make sure to check it all out over at mtgpreviews.com and oh anyway that brings us to the end of our daily dose of outlaws of thunder junction spoilers so we talked about a ridiculous number of cards so many cards there's like three sets in one there's so many mythics let me know what you think i will say on the way out the door 
my hype level is through the roof. I was kind of like medium on this set. I thought it would be good. I was excited about the special sheets, getting some new cards on Arena. Like that stuff I was really hyped about. But the power level of this set is way higher than I thought. The flavor of the set is way better than I thought. Just all around today's spoilers have blown me away. After like Murders at Karlov Manor, which honestly was just a pretty dud of a set where I was kind of like scraping around to like, can I find a good card to talk about? Come on, Watsy, like give us something. Today, like almost every single rare and mythic is an exciting card that can do something in standard, maybe in pioneer, maybe in modern, in commander for sure. So I feel like so far, Watsy has knocked it out of the park with this set in basically every way possible. And I am really, really hyped. But let me know what you think about in the comments and I'll be back tomorrow with even more outlaw at Thunder Junction spoilers. So until then, have an amazing day, everyone, and I will talk to you soon. Looking for even more magic? Well, make sure to check out last week's Against Thoughts right here, or maybe the video where we rank all the lose the game cards in magic.